Matthew chapter 20 in your Bible this morning. We'll let you get there. We will get to Matthew chapter 20 in a little bit. Okay. Matthew chapter 20. And uh, Matthew chapter 20 in your Bible. We'll let you get there. And uh, why well, you're quiet today? Wow. You know, I, I, I guess that's good. You know, <clears throat> I forget who it was. It, I don't know if, it, who was it? Is it George Whitfield or Wesley, one of those? Uh, his wife could not stand him being in the ministry and he refused to get out of the ministry. Which one was it, Karen? Uh, Wesley. Wesley, yeah. And, and, uh, and so she used to come to his meetings and throw rotten tomatoes at him and boo him. You know, so, so uh, you know, your silence, I guess I'm blessed. You know, anyway, you know, so then that, that that we're telling you the truth. You know, you sure you want to do this, Cameron? You know, anyway, but anyway, you know, there's family in the church, you know, and they come with rotten tomatoes and start booing you. Look out, bro. You know, there's the exit and uh, I'll let you have my Mustang for a quick getaway. There you go. All right. Now. OK, so now what we're going to do, we're going to go ahead and pray because we really need to do that first. OK, so let's do that first. And that way I don't get into like halfway into this thing and I'm here's the thing. Doesn't he pray anymore? You know, Heavenly Father, thank you for you. Thank you for what we've experienced in the service already here today. We're grateful for that. And, and above that, we're grateful for you being with us, your presence here. We're thankful for that. We're honored by that. We're humbled by it, but we're honored by that. And uh, we're happy about it, too, because it's uh, it's a family family gathering. Here we are. And we appreciate this. We pray, Lord, that uh, now, though, that you'd help us uh, during the sermon time, uh, that it would be profitable for us personally, for our families, even for this church family as we step out in this new year and uh, to seek to follow you, uh, to live your truth by your mercies and grace, and uh, to look for your leadership in our lives. Because uh, you know the way, Lord. We've never done this before. But you know all things, and you know the end from the beginning, and so we, we trust you, uh, not just with our lives for eternity's sake, but also for the here and now, right now, here in this life. So we pray, Holy Spirit, you'd help us to be attentive and receptive what the Lord God has for us today from his word. And may it be helpful in our lives. In your name, Lord, we pray. Amen. Now, I'm going to do this first because as I was studying for this sermon, uh, uh, the, the, the topic was on my mind for a little while. Uh, and as I was studying for the sermon, this stupid song came into my mind. Silly, it's not stupid, it's silly. But it's, it's kind of like sort of real. You know? This song, I think, is like from 1959 or 60 or 61. You know, and I had to look it up. Because, you know, you know things you remember, they start floating through your head, something triggers it in the way it goes, you know, and that's what happened. I'm trying to be spiritual and study the scriptures so I've got something to give you from the Lord, and this silly song started running through my head because of the topic that we're going to address this morning. And, and so, in case you're interested, you can find this on YouTube, because I did. And you don't even, and, and you can find it. Uh, I forget what what site it is about lyrics or whatever. You can find the lyrics because I had to find the lyrics, you know, to get it right. Because you got once you started getting it through your head, you got to get it right. You got to get the words right. You got to get it right. And I'm not dear, near going to sing it because uh, you know it's four part uh, harmony along with the ridiculousness of the song. But this is what came into my because because I, I have to tell you this. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about, about as we get into the new year, you are going to be blessed and you are privileged with this incredible power in your life. And I think I preach this about every five years, not this sermon, but this sort of this topic 
because I think it's important. You know what that incredible blessing is, that, that wonderful privilege you have, that you are able to make choices in your life. Not about everything, and we'll get to that in a minute, but about choices. That's an incredible blessing, incredible responsibility, uh, a wonderful thing that we see all the way back to the Garden of Eden, you know, with Adam and Eve, they had choice too. Boy, wait do we see them in heaven, huh? <laughs> you know, but if it wasn't Adam and Eve, it would have been Ken and Jackie, you know, it would have been somebody, you know, right? It would have been somebody, you know, you know. Uh, it would have been Don and Michelle, but they, they, look, they look like they have a halo today, but you know, I, it could have been them. It certainly wouldn't have been me and Tony, you know, because, you know, it'd be Dawn and Paul, maybe Dawn and Paul, you know, Bob and Sherry, you know, it could have been somebody, you know, Brian, Debbie, you know, if it wasn't Adam and Eve. But you see it all the way back from the beginning. Even though God's sovereign and he reigns, somehow he's worked this thing that you and I as human beings, uh, and then also as his children, you know, we, we, we have this privilege of choice. Not about everything, but but about maybe more than you you think. You think. So this is song kind of like just come in my head. You guys say, what's this got to do with the topic? Oh, an awful lot. It's all the the song is the doo wop song is entitled just nag. Do you ever hear that song? You're a nag, naggity nag. You ever hear that song? Anybody? Yeah, John, you know that song. You know, you're a nag, you're a nag, you're a nag. Would you go do this and go do that? Nag, naggity nag. You know, did you got the drift? Listen to this. And I'm not going to tell you if it's a guy group or a girl group that's singing this. You can figure this out for yourself. How's that? Okay. It says, you're always telling me a what to do. I just can't seem to get rid of you. You order me around just like a slave. You're going to send me to an early grave. Would you go fix the bacon, go for the Cokes, and rush down to the butcher shop and buy me a roast? <laughs> when is the nagging ever going to stop? You always seem to be blowing your top. One of these days I'm going to lose my mind, jump out the window, then I'll feel real fine. If you go do this and go do that and wash up all the dishes and don't talk back. Now, listen. Listen. When I married you, when I married you, you were so sweet. Okay. Now, you give me the bread and take all the meat. You're always screaming and hollering loud. I'm going to buy me a ticket to the nearest cloud. I don't know what to do. You make me mad. And when I leave this place, I'll sure be glad. You're working me uh, just like a horse. I guess you think you must be my boss with a go do this and go do that nag. And then it goes back to he reminisces. I shouldn't say he, but now I let the cat out of the bag. <laughs> <laughs> Then he reminisces about, about, you know, when he decided he would marry this person, this woman. Okay? He made a decision. He made a choice. Maybe back then he couldn't see what it was going to be like today. I don't know, but, uh, you know, he married her. I didn't. Anyway, listen. Then he goes, he's reminiscing. He says, when I married you, you were so sweet. Now you give me the bread and take all the meat. Then the rest of the song about naggity nag and all that kind of thing is in there. You know, okay. uh, you know what he's doing? He can't stay and live in with the choice he made. The decision he, he decided, you know, at a point in time in his life. And, and, and it may not be husband and wife, and I hope it's not. But I think all of us, from time to time, there are decisions we have made and choices we've made and wish we could jump out the window, too, from time to time. 
And there are other decisions and choices we make, and we're glad, yeah, we were on track, and praise God, and this is great. You know? So we're going to talk about this for a few minutes this morning, about deciding, about choices. It's interesting. Uh, what I want to do is explain some things from the text that I'm going to read in a couple of minutes. Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. I'm going to read those in a few minutes. But let me explain some things. You probably forget most of it, but it'll, it'll be on YouTube in a while. And if you want a CD, it's 1995. So, uh, so you can have it. You'll keep it. And, you know, so, so anyway, what I'm going to read is a parable. I'm going to read a parable. The Lord is, is uh, giving this parable uh, to the disciples and some other people around there, around them. So this is a parable that I'm going to read. The, and you know about parables. Parables teach a spiritual truth by way of an earthly story, and that way you can make a connection uh, to God and what He what He wants you to see in the situation. Um, and this parable, this parable is about is about grace, not debt, a debt owed. Uh, this parable is about grace and one's choice to receive or reject it, or understand, even understand it, perceive it. Uh, this parable is about grace being uh, consistent or in agreement with the uncontaminated purity of the goodness of the character of God. Now, I want to talk to you, too, uh, and say a few things about some of the words in our text that I'll read to you in a few minutes out of Matthew chapter 20. In, in Matthew 20, it, it says, uh, the kingdom of heaven is likened to... And then it goes on to the parable. The kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven. A little bit about the kingdom of heaven. This is a little long, and the rest is not near as long as the words. But the kingdom of heaven is an Old Testament concept. The kingdom of heaven. You can find the kingdom of heaven in the book of Psalms. You can find the kingdom of heaven in the book of Daniel. And also in the book of Ezekiel, the kingdom of heaven. And, uh, and when you get into the New Testament, the only book you find the kingdom of heaven mentioned is actually the book of Matthew. I don't know, it's 20-some, 30-some times in the book of Matthew, you'll read the kingdom of heaven. If you go through the rest, the rest of the gospels into the rest of the New Testament, the kingdom of heaven, you don't see it, you see it in Matthew. Now, the idea that, uh, the, the idea with Matthew, Matthew was, was written with, with more of a, the, the Jewish person in mind, so they would get the connection when you said, the, math, uh, the kingdom of heaven rather than the kingdom of God. And often the Jews back then, they talked about, when they talked about, about, uh, about, about God, the kingdom of God, they would substitute God and use the word heaven. Because you understand about Jews, if they're very strict in their beliefs, that they don't speak the word of God. And when you see the word of God written, what's missing? The vowel is missing in the middle, the O is missing because they, 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 they will, they reverence God and esteem him highly. And so, and so they don't even want to say his name. And so often they would use the word heaven and people understood then that they, they were meant God. We said about the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. And that gets me to my next point. When you read about the kingdom of heaven, uh, there are some differences in, in the scriptures about the kingdom of God, kingdom of heaven, but, but for the, for the most part, when we're thinking about it today, they are both the same. So when you read the kingdom of heaven in Matthew, you read the kingdom of God in the other gospels, it's talking about the same thing. The kingdom of heaven also has, has, if I could say two parts to it, in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, uh, right now, it, 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 uh, consists of those who profess that they know Christ or they're following Lord or God. And there are, there are the other ones who are the true believers actually possess salvation, eternal life, uh, through Christ. And, and it's interesting about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is pictured as, as in it, in it as having both good things and bad things. Of having, having wheat and the tares, having believers and those that don't believe. About, about having sheep and goats. And in the end, the Lord, the Lord actually makes the separation and the distinction one day in the future. 
So in the kingdom of heaven, there's, there's also uh, what, what we know and see through people's words and works, and there's also what we cannot see and know what's in their heart and what their motives are. And it's interesting what it says about, about the kingdom of heaven. God rules uh, uh, both, if I could say, both aspects of the kingdom. God rules both aspects of the kingdom, the external things and the internal things. God rules. And like I said, we'll do the final separation for the kingdom. You read about that in Matthew 25. If I could say it this way, there's, there's one, two, three, four, five, five phases of the kingdom of heaven or the kingdom of God. It's prophesied in Daniel. It's presented by John the Baptist and Jesus. He said, behold, the kingdom of heaven is at what? At hand it was presented. But there's also the other phase. Remember that it was rejected, right? The kingdom of heaven was rejected by the Jews, rejected. And now, now as the kingdom of heaven is 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 here on earth in a sense right now, the idea is the Lord rules and reigns from heaven, and he doesn't fully exercise his divine will over earth right now. He will one day, because we have power of choice and about some things. God doesn't do that right now, okay? But he does rule and reign in believers' hearts, which is also internally, that's part of the kingdom also, okay? And that's why, you know, we pray, you know, I will be done on earth as it is in heaven, and one day it's actually going to happen. There's another phase or part of this kingdom of heaven that's, uh, that's realized in the future, the millennial reign of Christ here on earth. It's actually going to be here. It's actually going to happen. He's going to reign as king in Jerusalem for a thousand years. And then you have the reality of eternity. The eternal kingdom is also part of the kingdom of heaven, the kingdom of God. So for now... Within the framework of the kingdom of heaven, God is working and reigning through grace offerings to humanity. God owes us nothing. God owes us nothing. He freely offers grace because of his great kindness and goodness and love toward us. But you're probably saying good uh, when I say this. That's enough about the kingdom of heaven. Also in the text you read the householder. There's a householder in our parable. The householder is God the Father. You read about the marketplace in the parable. That's the world. You read about the vineyard. Uh, that's that's the, the the vineyard. You know, there's a little discussion what the vineyard is, but the vineyard is the, is the area or sphere of 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 work of the of the Christian church, which has a mix of the wheat and the tares, the believers, unbelievers, the those who profess but those who actually possess uh, Christ. Um, and then you have the laborers, those who participate in the work for or of God. And then you have the steward in the parable, and that's actually Christ. The steward actually does the householder, or the God, the Father's will. You'll see that in the parable. Now, we're going to read this, Okay. Read this, and you can fit all this in to the reading, what I've just told you. Then your head can explode. Okay, now you'll be all right. Okay, so you understand a little bit. It says, For the kingdom of heaven is like unto a man that is a householder, which went out early in the morning to hire laborers into his vineyard. And when he had agreed, when he agreed with the laborers for a penny a day, a penny a day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, the third hour, what's the third hour? Third hour is what? Anybody know? Third hour is what? Is it nine o'clock? Third hour is what? Noon. Is it noon? Third hour noon? Yeah, the day started at six. Third hour is what? Nine. Thank you. Okay. So he went out there at the third hour and saw others standing idle in the marketplace and said unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right I will give you. And they went their way. This group didn't even have a discussion about a wage. They just He said, I'll give you what, what, what's, a, what's a rightful wage. Just go ahead and go. And they did. 
And again, he went out about the sixth hour, the ninth hour, and did likewise. And about the eleventh hour, that's five o'clock at night, because the day was done at six, at sundown at six. And he went out about the sixth and ninth hour, did likewise about the eleventh hour. He went out, I'm in verse six, and found others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? And they said unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go ye also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right, that shall ye receive. So when even was come, when the day was over, and they're following Jewish law that you can read about in Deuteronomy, at the, at the end of the day, the wages were paid out. Okay? They, the Lord taught the Israelites, listen, a, a, a day's work, you pay a day's wage at the end of the day. Okay, and that's what's happening here. So, so what you have, okay, and uh, and uh, and where are we at? We're in verse number number. Now I can't even see where I'm at. Okay, and when they said unto him, because no man hired me, go to vineyard, and whatsoever is right shall receive. Eight. So when even was come, verse eight, the Lord of the vineyard saith unto his steward, call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. The last first, you see that at the end of the parable. The last are going to be first, the first are last. Okay. When they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received every man a penny. Now when it says a penny, a penny back then, what, what it's signifying is, is a day's wage for a laborer. An honest day's work of a laborer, that was an, an honest, decent wage given. A legitimate wage. Okay, okay, an honest wage for an honest day's work. Okay, verse 10. But when the first came, when they finally got to the first, they supposed that they should have received more, more than a day's wage. Okay, and they likewise received every man, what? (laughs) A day's wage, the penny. And when they had received it, they what? They murmured against the good man of the house, saying, These last have wrought but one hour, and thou hast made them equal unto us, which have borne the burden and heat of the day. But he answered one of them. Evidently, the laborers had a spokesman among them, you know, somebody that took the lead and voiced the the criticism. But he answered one of them and said, Friend, and friend here is not like I'm endeared to you. Friend is kind of like, you know, listen, you know, friend, like, dude, we got an issue here. You know, like if we would say that today, do you say dude anymore, you guys? You guys, what do you say now? You know, maybe we shouldn't repeat what you say. I don't know. But what do you say now? So when it says friend here, it, it, listen, the, the steward is not saying, listen, I'm in love with you. You're my best bud and all that. Now he's saying, listen, dude, we got an issue here. Okay. It's not endearment. Okay. Friend, I do thee no wrong. You didn't do any wrong. I didn't do anybody any wrong. Didst thought thou agree with me for a penny? Didn't you agree? A day's work for a day's wage? Take that thine is and go thy way. I will give unto this last even as unto thee. Is it not lawful for me to do what I will with mine own, with my own money? Is thine eye evil because I'm good? I've been generous to these other people that weren't hired until later in the day. So, so the last shall be first and the first last, for many be called, few are chosen. Now, for us today, we need to be really careful. For us today, in the, in the day and age in which we live, we need to be really careful with how we reason this out. Okay? Because you might conclude that the householder through the steward, the householder through the steward, okay, was being unfair. Because of the grace extended to all, the grace was extended to all because everybody got hired. The grace was extended to all so all could be employed and all could gain a wage, okay, uh, being unfair because the grace extended to all in the, t- in the parable is not the same. Not the same amount of grace. Okay? But the result or the payout of the blessing is the same. We have to think about this, you know. We have to be careful. Our our focus is on 
when we look at this, how unfair this is, that, that everybody got paid the same, even though everybody didn't have the same hours of work put in. And we would call the National Labor Relations Board. We would call, you know, uh, uh, human resources and get a hold of payroll and ask what in the world's going on. You know, we'd go on strike. You know, we'd throw rotten tomatoes at the boss's car. You know, we'd have all kinds of issues like that. And then some of you would probably think, because of your persuasion maybe, you would think since, since everybody got paid the same regardless of what they did or didn't do for the day, you think the Lord in this parable is teaching it's okay to be a socialist or a communist. Everybody gets paid the same whether they work or not or whatever their level is and everybody's the same and now we have social justice for all through the wages of everybody regardless of what their productivity is and that's not what's being taught either. Did I cover everything or is there more on your mind? You know? So we, we have to be careful about this. Okay? That we don't come away with thinking, you know, uh, uh, the steward is being unfair. Okay? He's not being unfair. And he's, he's not being deceitful. Because you can read verses 10 through 15. And he's the good man of the house, not the bad man. And he's not trying to give anybody any grief, but this first group of laborers, they decided to go ahead and work for that wage. They knew what it was. They made the choice to do this. And now they don't want to live with the choice that they made. See? So some of these workers, the workers of all day, received the day's wages, not like the others that worked partial day and got, got the same wage. Listen, these workers are angry at the good man of the house, but they had agreed to the terms offered for their employment. Maybe you were in that situation one time. You decided you're going to, you're looking for this particular job or whatever it is that you, you're interested in. And, uh, you realize you got hired in for a certain amount. You know, so maybe you should always negotiate about your starting salary or your starting wage. Cause a little bit later down the road, maybe three months later, six months later, you found out through the grapevine that one of your fellow employees that got hired after you, got paid another dollar or two an hour more than you did when you started. And you feel like what just happened. You know what just happened? Okay? You, deci you, you decided that's the wage you accept. That's what happened. And whatever the company decided to do later, that's up to them, not up to you. So my advice to you is, when you think about getting being employed, you want to make sure you get a good starting wage because you never know what else might happen along the way. But that's not in the parable. That's just free advice. You're looking at me like I'm crazy. But anyway, that's okay. You know, these workers, these all-day workers that got paid the same as everybody else, that didn't put in the hours that the all-day workers did, listen, they made the decision. To do so they made the choice for the wage of the day they did they did and now they're angry about the result of their decision have you ever been like that ever angry about some choice you made some decision you decided you know and you followed through on you know these these laborers these all-day laborers they're really irate about the consequences of what they had freely agreed to and not only that, okay, it, and, and it helped agitate them because what they did, they compared themselves to somebody else who seemed to do better than they did with a lot less effort. And now they're furious because they feel they've got taken to the cleaners, they got taken advantage of, but hold on, wait a minute, wait a minute. When they were hired, it was up front, this is what the wage was going to be for the day. These workers are angry at the good man when they are the ones responsible for the result of what they decided or chose to do. You know what? You know this already. 
There's an awful lot about life that we, we just don't control. We don't. Awful lot about life that we don't control. And if we'd make another confession that we, we would like to reign as sovereign of life. <laughs> uh, but we don't. So we won't because we can't. Somebody else has that job. And, and in that, so many things are beyond our realm of being able to choose how something is going to be. But God, in his, in his sovereign rule, does grace our lives. He does grace our lives with many opportunities and privileges of choice. He does. We have control of everything, but there's plenty of opportunity and privilege of choice in our lives. You know, when we choose well, we decide something and, and, it's, and it's good, and, and, and things are like, you know, we're satisfied with this, it works that well. When we choose well, we pat ourselves on the back, we let others know how skilled and smart we are, you know, we do. And, uh, but when we choose, when we choose something, listen, and the consequences are not as we, we perceived or presumed they would be. And we reap what we've chosen, but we don't like it. In fact, sometimes we hate it. Sometimes we try to wish it away. That why did I ever do this? Why did I ever agree to this? You never said that? Why did I decide that? What in the world was I thinking then? We've chosen. We don't like it. We don't like the consequence. We don't like the outcome. We don't like the result. You know, we, we've chosen it. We don't like it. We hate it. We try to wish it away. We try to pray it away. Have you ever done that? Try to pray something away? Sure. You know, pray it away. We try to make it go away somehow. We complain. We cry, complain. The Bible word in the parable is murmur to anyone who will listen. And sometimes we even get frustrated with the Lord in the thing, you know, or get mad, angry at him. But the truth is, he didn't do us any harm. He's the good man of the house, not the bad man. You know, we're blessed with opportunities and privileges of choice. And I have to tell you this, that our choices and the decisions that we, we have presented to us as we live life, even though we're not in necessarily in control of all things of life, it's inescapable. You have to decide some things in your life. Even if you don't, you did. If it's your responsibility to choose. Some of our choices, some of my own decisions and choices, they're great. They're, you're like me. You're like more, me more than you think you are, you know. Or I'm like you more than I think I am. Scary, isn't it? You know, we're kind of like the same, you know. Listen, some of our decisions and choices are great. Great. Some of them are good. Uh, some of them, you know, we see gain out of it. Something is produced that's, that, that's noble and worthy. And we see gain. It, it's, 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 some of our decisions are very helpful. Some of them you look back and said, where did I ever come up with that, 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 that wisdom that come, go there and decide that, you know? And, uh, you know, and that's great. But others, others give you grief. We're just bad decisions, you know? Foolish, 
fickle. Some of the choices just are just hurtful, costly in your emotion, in your spirit, uh, sometimes in your in your physical body, your wallet or purse. And what we notice is, as time goes by, that 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 if if we run a vein of how we choose and how we decide, and either way, things are well, things are not well. Your decisions and choices have a cumulative effect also in set a direction of life. How well you'll live your life, how well you'll honor God, you know, how well you'll be a help to somebody else or a blessing to somebody else. Or how free you will be to go ahead and sacrifice yourself to minister on behalf of the Lord to others. You know, the cumulative effect. It can free you, your choices, decisions, it can enslave you. Think about your choices. Coming to a new year, you're going to have a host of decisions and choices to make again. God has blessed your life with that, graced your life with that. What are you going to do with those choices? So I would say this to you. You've heard that people probably gave you advice. You ought to make wise choices, sound decisions that will help you in your life about all kinds of things. Okay? And uh, that that's good advice. And that you should pray and you should talk it over and, you know, check it out and don't be so much in a hurry, you know, take your time and so you're deliberate and that, that, they're all good things. But I thought about this for an awful lot of things about our life and I'm just about through, okay? Almost through, okay? Just so it depends. I'm getting through, okay? Um, if you guys want to come up here and sit up here, that's, that, I'm, I'm good. Don't we have a last song? That's what I thought. Yeah, come on up, man. Come on up. Yeah. Singers, wake up. Here we are. We're going to be over here, and I'm going to finish. They weren't sleeping. I'm just teasing. Okay. What, why don't we think this? Lord, instead of help me, uh, and I understand what you're saying, and God does too, instead of help me make wise decision or the best, why don't we think about, for a lot of these things, about issues of life, Help me to make godly decisions. Ooh, godly decisions in life. Help me to make godly choices in my life. Things that reflect, you know, the character of God, what God would pursue, what honors God, what's of value and worth as far as God's concerned in your life. You know, how about that? Do we ever think that? You know, that. And I'll tell you, godly choices come by way of living a life of, of godliness, or if I would say righteousness, instead of living a life of sin. Do you know that? Sin stunts your ability for discernment from God to be applied to the situation you're deciding. Did you know that? There's nothing good about a, about a life of sin. It should be a life of pursuing righteousness. And in that, just simply because you're in that pursuit of that will help you make godly decisions. Doesn't that make sense? I'm oversimplifying it. No, no I don't think I am. I, I don't think I am. And, and that if you would pursue that, I want to make godly choices, godly decisions, and, uh, and I, and I'm able to do that by, by a life of righteousness instead of living a life of sin and just carefree and, ah, I'll do what I want. You know. Because if you live that life of righteousness instead of sin, you're, you're actually, you will actually live out Proverbs chapter three that you've all heard before. Proverbs three, five, six, and seven. And seven. Because, because sometimes, you know, nothing against God. God knew how to write the scripture. I'm not getting into that. But, but seven could go very well before verse number five. Because verse seven says, Be not wise in thine own eyes. 
but fear the Lord and depart from evil. Now, verse 8 says, because that's where you get the blessing of God upon your life. Maybe even to help you make the right choices, the best decisions, the things that are godly, that honor Christ and are of value. So then it goes back to verse 5 that then in this, whatever I'm deciding, choosing, you know, I'm going to trust in the Lord with all my being, with all my heart. I'm going to trust him. In, in trust, that, that means in trust, you, you're, you're counting on him, but in that, in that trust, in, with trust, there's a degree of faith, and in faith, there's obedience. Isn't there a song somewhere that says, trust and obey? I thought so. You know? So to help me make godly decisions. Okay. That my life is a pursuit of righteousness to honor God. And in that then, it's certainly much easier to trust the Lord with all your heart. Trust him with all your heart. What's in your heart? What do you have to decide? What's the pursuit? What's the question? What's the issue? And it says there what? And don't lean to your own understanding. Now what it, what it means, it doesn't mean that you act stupid because you have faith and you just take a leap. That's not what it means. What it means is don't lean to your own understanding. Uh, ultimately, okay, it's not that you shouldn't use this and can't get help and input the idea is, in the end, there's something beyond all that that you're trusting in, and that's the Lord and his leadership and the Holy Spirit's guidance along with what you've accumulated from human understanding and wisdom. So the idea is where I'm going to go beyond here to the Lord. And in that, in all your ways, acknowledge him. All your ways. And if you'll acknowledge him. In other words, what it is, Lord, I'm trusting you. I have all this before me. I've asked people. They're praying for me. I gathered information. It could be whatever, anything. I don't, I don't know. And, and, and here it is. And I want you in this. And I want your leadership in this. And I, 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 I cannot decide this and step out without your help. In all your ways. Acknowledge him. Okay. You know what it says? Guess what it says? He'll help you make your choice. He'll help you make the decision. That's what it says. It says, if you'll do this, acknowledge him in all your ways. He shall what? What's he going to do? Direct your path. Direct your path. Give you the answer. Help you decide. Help you choose what honors him, what's godly, what's helpful, what's of value, what's of worth. What will actually help you step out into the path, the continued path that God has for you. Lord, I pray you'd help us what we heard today. There's, a, there's, a, there's an awful lot more that could be said, but enough at least to get us thinking about this. And we pray that, uh, that, that something of this time together in your word will be helpful to us. Because we do live with consequences, good, bad, in between. There are results to all our decisions and choices. May you help us to do well as we decide the issues of life in this new year to come. Amen.